That's a good world. Write it down. English plays now. So does everybody know who Andy Rooney is? I know way Andy Rooney. He used to be on television. Um, Sixty minutes. They finished up with him. He'd always go, "Yeah, I know this." Um, <laughs> so before your time, I suppose we should get started. So, um, <laughs> lecture. Stop sharing. No, we're gonna try to. So lecture twenty-two. So who else prepaid for luggage? Not me. Yes, what you, I'm YouTube, right? Okay, you shared. I paid for five, so it's like, whom I missed it. So, Abby, okay. Oh, we're going on that part. Right. We're hoping, yeah. So, um, I got, I put a request in for a van. I don't know if we got it yet. Um, but going over to Curtin Brothers, oh, cool. looking at their uh, rotary and maybe what else we can. When we get back, you've got your showmanship time and or we probably got to figure out the rest of the semester. I was hoping to have that done by the time I got here today, but it just not happening. So I apologize. So we got to get to exam two at some point. So. Wait, so what are you just doing? We're leaving one in theory to go to the curtains be here by two. Sounds good. Um, I got to. See if we got the van or not. I submitted it over the weekend. They're probably like, damn. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm sitting there, I got the, you know, I pulled it out to pay to go and then like I can't get it back to you, you know, leave it right here. And the lights don't come on, so I couldn't see that I'd left it behind. Yeah. So, uh, so but Joe Lansing, the guy in charge of the vans, had it on his desk. So, um, somebody was very nice and put that back. So, okay, so I think I gave this handout to you last time. Maybe uh, or it should be part of the previous handout, right? Ten smart things to do to achieve milking excellence. So this is kind of a focus on um, 
making sure that we're managing our, our managing and minimizing our, our mastitis as best we can. So we want to do these 10 things. We'll talk about each of them in turn. So set performance goals, identify problems rapidly, milk clean cows, standardize on milking routines, train their staff, uh, maintain and update your milking systems, have treatment protocols, have vaccine biosecurity plans, take care of your dry cows, and where appropriate, ask for help, ask for consultants. So setting performance goals. So what do you want your somatic cell to be? What do you want your bacteria accounts to be? Are the ones set by the milk processor good enough for you? 400,000 is usually for somatic cell and then whatever triggers for PI or standard plate or lab pasteurization. What do you want your goals to be? And at least in New York, there seems to be a reasonable incentive to get that somatic cell down fairly low. Whereas I wasn't seeing those in California, California, right? They really didn't have the premiums that we do out here. It's up to 20 cents, I think. Yeah, if you got below 200,000. Below 200,000 was, I think, some below 175. Yeah, it was like 175,000. Yeah, 120. So, but yeah, not much below that. So, there is some there, but we can get a total of 55 if we get everything done all the way down to 100, below 100. So, um, and we managed to do that up in the dairy by pulling out that milk for pasteurization. So, um, so what are your clinical mass status goals? Probably something less than 10% of the herd gets clinical mastitis, probably five is even better, but what is your goal? And then how does that compare to what's actually happening? We all have to have that zero antibiotic residue or we're on a government watch list. Um, so what is realistic for a 12 month period? So these are, if you look at national averages and national distributions, where we are, I think anymore we need to get below 200,000 um, as kind of a minimum, but that only puts you probably in the 40th percentile. Um, not everybody's below 200,000, and that just kind of strikes me as odd. So, um, so less than 2% new cases per month. And most of you know how to look up to see how many new cases you have. There are a number of ways you can look at whatever cutoff you want. So 200,000, how many new cases do I have if I'm on DHI test? Or how many cases do you record? We want to be able to identify problems rapidly. So, and then record that stuff and look for patterns, look for Continue things, uh, continuing problems. So we need treatment records, who gets treated, when. So certainly um, Dairy Comp helps us integrate um, the uh, withhold times to our milking system. So knowing who's there, getting those in, inputted. What is it they say with um, robots? You enter the cow that you treated before you go treat them with robots because there's a lag there and the cow could actually, if you A, forget to do it or don't do it immediately, when you come back, that cow can actually get into the robot and be milked before you have that withhold there. So looking at your individual cast mastitis cases, are you getting on top of them as quickly as you can? We know with uh, somatic cell count, we have at least the bolt tank. It'd be nice if we had some individual records, but that requires DHI. And you have to decide whether it's worth paying that or not. So knowing the percent number of cows that had to leave the herd because of mastitis. 
Gives us a feel for if it's a problem or not. Milking clean cows. So if we keep our cows clean, we should be able to minimize our mastitis. So it's a direct correlation between the cleanliness of the cows and the somatic cell scores. So we think about that as just more pathogens at the T-den, more bacteria at the T-den. But it also might, might be that it's just a stressful environment. So um, we might get more somatic cells that way. So dirty cows show an increased risk, and that's a function of more at the T-den. As that cow moves around, if the pressure changes, may suck whatever's on the T-den inside to the udder especially as we get um, closer to milking where things are moving around. We'd like to standardize our milking routines. We talked about this last fall that there's a lot of different routines and I think on the farm you guys were on, there wasn't a uniform. I don't know if you guys got to observe milking or not. So they, at least some of the groups identified that everybody was doing things differently and Cows like the same thing every day. So if you come in and something different happens with that cow in the parlor, what's going to happen? Stress leads to what? Adrenaline, which leads to poor letdown. And if we don't get that cow fully milked out, there's the increased risk of mastitis with that backup or that increased pressure. So training their staff. So there was a discussion with somebody who was using um, one of the farms that said it was using prison labor or something. So they never knew who was going to be there on any given day. So they were discussing, I forget who I was talking to about it, but they never bothered training people. And they said, we're lucky if we can get them to hang. If we can get them to hang the machine on the cow, we're doing all right. But trying to do anything else, we've got such turnover, they come in and out. It's very hard for us to keep on top of that. Um, that seems like an excuse, but um, you've got to have at least more than that. Um, so a lot of people just do what I do here, just do this, never really sit down and talk about the milk ejection reflex, the keeping those um, teat ends clean. Um, so as an industry, we're not doing a very um, complete job of training. So on the job experience with a supervisor, trying to talk them through as they work. It's probably not the best way to go. So, so how do you motivate people? How do you keep people engaged? How do you keep doing people doing the right job, doing the job right? If you figure all that out, you'll probably be a very rich person because a lot of people want to know how to do that. So. Making sure our machines are updated and maintained. So what two weeks for lab is we've got um, Finger Lakes coming in to talk about measuring and monitoring and checking a system. So we've got vacuum levels. We got to make sure they're they're there where they should be, and then they hold that level consistently even during the highest flow rates for the cows. Inflations must be replaced when worn, so knowing how many milkings you get and then scheduling that replacement. Making sure we check all our parts and hoses and rubber for cracks and leaks. So part of maintaining the system, making sure automatic takeoffs are set properly. There's a number of different schools of thought at what flow rate you shut them off. Um, Give it a flow rate per minute, then you move. So the higher the flow rate, the more likely you're not to not gonna have that animal milk get milked out. The lower the flow rate, the 
the longer you're leaving that system on or that milking machine on and the problems that can occur with that slowing down your throughput um, over milking possibly liner slips that are going to cause problems so making sure everything's where you need it to be and then get everything on maintenance schedule with your equipment provider making sure that things are checked on a regular basis make sure all the fluids and you know, up in the dairy one of the problems we had is um, with a water softener up there, some employee change, and then the water softeners weren't being reloaded. And so, you know, trying to figure out who does what, and certainly up the dairy, there's so many people doing things that if one person is missing, sometimes things don't get done. Whereas on most farms, and fewer people involved, and it's easier to remember things um, and easier to notice when somebody's not there and what do they do? Okay, they're not here, so I need to cover them in some way. So making sure that everything gets done on a timely basis. Having treatment protocols, given the type of mastitis you have or given the symptoms that you're dealing with, what is your protocol? So if you've got mastitis as a one, is that treated differently than if your mastitis is at a three? Does everybody know the one to three scoring system for mastitis? Kind of. So you'll we'll learn it here probably within the week if we don't get to it today. Um, so how do you treat mastitis? Do you treat mastitis? What do you do? You include antibiotics. Most farms are going and getting rid of antibiotics completely. So we treat the symptoms with non-antibiotic therapies, fluids, hypertonic saline, um, aspirin, banamine. Let the cow take care of the problem. Or is there something we do intermammary injections? What are we doing? How are we doing it? So what type of mastitis do you treat? Hopefully that you asking a question? Yeah. yeah. What? Is it mean? Farms are falling away from it. Is it just because of price? They're not necessarily. Could be price, could be supply. I know and for a while nobody can get yeah. anything. Um, I think it's more of does it really do anything? And we'll have that discussion. Do antibiotics really make a difference on the farm? And there's only one or two types of bacteria that seem to respond during lactation to antibiotic therapy, strep ag and staph aureus. If you don't have those, you got your gram negative, um, environmental mastitis, it's hard to get any antibiotic response at all. So why are you spending the time with the antibiotics? Why are you spending the money on the antibiotics? Why are you taking the chance that that's going to end up in the tank? It's really, you'd be better off squirting on the floor. So we'll talk about that. So what type of mastitis do you have? We have brand negative or brand positive. I think I heard those differences before. Environmental versus contagious. Each of those Aries has a different way they should be treated. Then we'll talk about those differences as we go. How do you know what type of mastitis the cow has? Hopefully we will get a chance here to plate. I've ordered plates from uh, triplates. Does anybody work with triplates? So if you're interested in figuring out, you guys did my plates for calves and heifers. We got triplates coming, I hope. I got an email back and said, yeah, we can get them to you. I said, I need them by the end of April. So um, usually it only takes a week. So um, we'll take the high somatic cell cows that haven't been treated with antibiotics. We'll collect some samples and we'll play them out, see what we come up with. So depending on the type or the bacteria that's involved, there are different treatment strategies. So and how do we dry treat? So, and anymore, is it do we dry treat? There are some places that it's like, you know, there's a place down on River Road that doesn't dry cows off at all. 
So they milk straight through. Um, the, they say that saves them $40,000 a year. Now, the question is, you get as much milk the next lactation? No, you don't. But if you have a high call rate or a high turnover, it might be better just to milk them straight through. If you want animals to last multiple lactations, I think there's some benefit in the dry period. So, um, but, so how do you keep records of treatments? How do you mark treated cows? How do you know which cows are treated? You certainly got the flasting there. So all of the answers to these questions should be addressed in whatever the treatment protocol is. So how do we do all the things that need to be done with a treatment protocol related to mastitis? So how do we know what we're doing? How do we decide what we're doing? Is it based on the severity of the mastitis? Is it based on the organism? Is it based on where they are in lactation? How are you going to do things? So mastitis biosecurity plans. We ran into some biosecurity plans here at the nationals. So if we've got 18% of the milk cows are purchased, that means they're coming from somewhere else. They may or may not be bringing in something that you don't already have. So 45% of the herds have at least introduced one cow. So one new cow, again, not familiar with the um, microbes on your farm, might be bringing microbes in from another farm. So we're looking at this from a mastitis perspective, but hairy heel warts, contagious. Um, I guess the uh, bird flu, at least talking to some of the other coaches that are from those states, they're saying it all pretty much traces back to one farm one group of farms so so and it's all sort of dying out which means we're okay this time but when it mutates and comes back we're all in trouble so it's going to be much more aggressive the next time around so that do i guess it's lung issues cut milk production in half they get really i guess lung problems they milk i think was like off as well. Um, so they're dumping like 60% of the cows in some way, shape, or form. So, get so bought lactating cows, but only 6% of the herds isolated their purchased animals. So do you have a place on your farm to put animals that have come from another source so you can know whether or not they're sick in any way, shape, or form? Can you isolate for 24 hours, 48 hours? Do you screen for mastitis? You do any of that stuff. Most farms don't have any place they can isolate an animal that's away from all other animals, especially if it's milking, because then I won't be able to milk. Okay. <laughs> so if it's way over in the back 40, but having that isolation period, we don't do it in dairy, but pigs do, chickens do, horses have isolation. So, so <laughs> there are a lot of people that'll buy a herd without testing anything. Give me at least the somatic cell count, right? On that animal. Or at least the CMT. Give me something. Does it have mastitis or not? Is it vaccinated? Any of that stuff. So most herds are not requiring anything new. Didn't ask for somatic cell. Didn't ask for a milk culture. If you got, know what you're buying. You don't want to bring in staff to your herd. Strep ag is easy enough to cure. You don't want to bring mycotoxin into your herd. So if we can get those cultures, we know what we're dealing with. There's a help there. So buying healthy cattle. If you've got younger, non-lactating animals, 
There's a lower risk of bringing in things related to mastitis. What do we have to deal with with our uh, pre-calving heifers, springers? What are we usually dealing with? Things that might be transmitted by flies when they're youngsters. So if you got a lot of flies, especially biting flies, those stable flies we talked about, on those teat eggs, there's an opportunity that bacteria gets introduced when their calves stays there until they lactate and then they calve in for that first time with mastitis. But taking a look at the farm, see how they're raising the young stock. We have less chance if we have a non-working udder to bring stuff in. Buying from a known healthy herd. Looking at somatic cell counts, either on a herd basis or cow basis. Could decide, well, okay, I'll buy the whole herd, but as they come in, nah, -uh, that one's gone, that one's gone, that one's gone. Um, or at least putting them somewhere else. So trying to purchase those cows, um, having them separate using a CMT, and if they test positive for CMT, running a culture on it. So culturing tanks twice a month during periods when cows are entering the herd, see if you can get anything that pops up and certainly want to be on top of mycoplasm if you have it, because if you get that in your herd, it's not a good day. They can, it can go through the whole body and it starts to mess with the growth plates. So depending on which plates prematurely grow, you can have help to head to, you got ear infections, and you can also get uneven growth plate movement. So their heads will like twist, their mouth will go to the right and the left. If you've ever seen that, <laughs> yeah, about like that. Um, so those are the ones that you call immediately if they're positive. There's nothing else you can yeah. do. Get them out of the herd. So they, there's no, you can't milk them through it. You can't, um, you can't treat it with antibiotics. And we'll talk about that. Um, how do antibiotics work? Um, so. So we've got the dry cows. We got an opportunity where we're not blowing the mastitis out two or three times a day or antibiotics out two or three times a day. So we know the immune system is depressed around calving. That's a higher risk for mastitis. So drying off is high time for infection because you've got um, the backup and the dripping in the system. And then the immune system um, depressed around calving that makes her more susceptible. So we're trying to keep everybody clean and dry. We isolate those sick animals until we know what we're dealing with. So making sure that they have everything that they need from a nutrition standpoint, all 50 nutrients. Vitamin E is a um, a uh, good one for the immune system, <laughs> antioxidant. Treat all quarters with approved dry cow treatment and dry off. That's certainly being come into question. There's a lot of people that are accusing um, animal agriculture of a Mercer, Michael, Michael, what is it? resistant staph aureus. Um, so, but the problem is most of the time it's humans transmitting the humans. Most of those super bugs that don't respond to penicillin come from hospitals. So you got all those things running around, but it's sort of like, you, well, you guys all saw that presentation about greenhouse gases. Yes. Everybody's blaming the cows but we're not the primary reason. And if everybody wants to deflect, it's like it's fossil fuels that are being burnt, either for home 
whatever. Now, there are ways probably you can find to take that out, but the long greenhouse gases, we've got more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than we've had in, I think, a million years. So, um, in what sense? Yeah, that's the thing. We'll be dead by the time we No, you won't. Unless you're going to die tomorrow. We're looking at probably 2050, things are going to get really bad. You mean if the rate we're going? Well, I'm, I'm talking about where we're doing what carbon we're putting into the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, you're looking at 2050 things. I mean, you go, I went to Alaska this summer and you look at where all the glaciers, I went there 25 years ago, where the glaciers are now. They've retreated miles from where I was there 25 years ago. Um, they have the actual markers on the thing. This is where the glacier was in 1970s, where it ate, yeah. and it's like, it's all the way up the hill. You can't even get to it anymore. It came all the way down to the valley. So you're seeing it a lot there, um, but it goes back to, as Abby alluded to, we have a lot of people on this planet. I mean, when I was a kid, they were talking about, you know, overpopulation, overpopulation. We're talking 2 billion people. We're gonna be four to five times that here in the next 10 years. And nobody talks about population control anymore. Um, there's just so many people on this planet doing things. So they've actually, everybody's heard of like Jurassic, um, Mesozoic, all the time periods in history. They've started the one right now as the uh, Athrocene. This period of time from a geology perspective, a planet perspective, is under the influence of humans. So we're influencing how the planet is experiencing things. Not that we're gonna, not that, I don't know if anybody here knows who George Carlin is. So, um, he's a comedian and you might say a philosopher on some level, he talks in one routine about saving the planet. You know, people are like, we got to save the planet. He goes, planet is fine. It's going to be here long after we're all gone as a species. It shake us off like a bad case of fleas. The planet will be fine. We're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it's not saving the planet. It's trying to figure out how we can mitigate our influences on things. So, um, and that's going to be a challenge. I mean, when I was in college, they talked about in the history of agriculture, you've got all the food ever produced. And they, they said the next 25 years, we have to equal the 10,000 years of agriculture in the next 25 years. So I assume we've gone by that already. It's going to, I mean, we got 9 billion people we got to feed. And water is going to be, a lot of people are talking about water being the new gold. You know, fresh water. We can't do without that. So where's all that going to come from? Where are we going to, how are we going to do what we need to do? And at some point, things are going to get really tough. Agriculture has stepped up over the last 75 years and keeps getting more and more productive. At some point, people are gonna appreciate what we've done for them, but it's not right now. So what do you look at cow, just the curve of lactation production. What do we get per cow? And then, you know, the we gotta get rid of animal agriculture if we're gonna save the human population. And it's like, well, the problem, problem with that thinking is cows eat things that we can't, and they turn it into things we need. They don't understand that. No. So we, like, I had this argument with uh, my high school teacher. It was many years after the fact, but I kept in touch with my biology teacher. And she goes, well, you know, cows are a problem. I said, no, they're not. And I pulled up, like, typical ration, you know, 
what is a direct competition from a animal perspective, human to animal, maybe 10 pounds of what a cow eats. Most of what a cow eats is recycling, right? Canola meal, that's waste product from humans, right? Most of the protein sources are waste products that we don't eat. We could, I guess, but we don't. All that forage, you're not gonna be able to throw kids on that. You might be able to survive as an adult if you get it really, really short. But we're talking big yields that cows turn into stuff that we can use. So cows as recyclers, cows as scavengers that are bringing calories into the human population, as opposed to extracting it and taking it away. I don't, I haven't done the math, but if I had to guess, there is a net gain by having animal agriculture. So, but that's my take on it. But you don't think. Nope, I don't. So teat sealants. There's some thought there, internal or external, making sure we vaccinate our dry cows. That seems to make a difference um, when we're calving in, fighting those E. coli invasions. So making sure we check our cows as part of our fresh cow scre screening, checking for mastitis, CMT. And anybody that turns positive, we go through and culture. So using the appropriate consultants, take advantage of the expertise. So there's a lot of people, and this goes back to extension. It's not as probably as extensive as it used to be. Extension is much reduced, but extension works for you as a farmer. That's why they exist. Now, most of that area's consultants are now selling product of some sort. But finding the right people, asking the right questions, trying to understand the problem well enough to find the right person to talk to. So they should make you money. They should not cost you money if they're doing their job. So it's always helpful if you've got somebody that's been on a lot of different farms and seen a lot of different things, what we call experience. There's an opportunity there to use their experience to see things that you may not. So getting directly into mastitis. So what is mastitis? So what mast is what? Of or pertaining to the mammary gland, itis is what? Inflammation, swelling, or irritation. So, so swell, inflammation, or irritation of the mammary gland. Does it have to be an infection? No, it doesn't. Usually it is with our cows, but not always. So you can have chemical irritation, you can have physical irritation. We had a cleaner that applied for a milker job up the dairy. Um, he started kicking cows in the udder, so he had to go back to being a cleaner. Um, so we don't want that problem there. So mastitis causes, as we said, could be physical trauma to the udder, could be chemical problems but almost always it's a bacteria of one type or another. So I think we've showed you this diagram before, things that are gonna predispose that cow to mastitis, maybe got problems with the milking machine, maybe got characteristics of the cow, the way she prefers to lay in the alleyways or She's got certain confirmation issues. Maybe she's a little, she doesn't tighten down on that teat end as fast as some other ones. You got the milking procedure, you got the environment that she's in, but we have those infectious organisms we need to understand and then hopefully learn to control. So we already talked about the milking machines, 
They might be a reservoir for bacteria if we don't get them clean, exposing that animal. We talked about impacts. We talked about liner not working the way it should. We have T den damage if it stays open too long or doesn't massage and rest like it should. We may have um, a wire that stays collapsed because there's leaks in the system and we don't get adequate milk out. Those things are going to predispose that animal to mastitis. So impacts, if we've got an air slit on one side, coming in on either side of the T, if things are lined up, that air is going to go to the place where there's vacuum, and that may carry aerosols of milk with it and predispose that animal there. So we're thinking about clinical mastitis. Clinical is mastitis we can see. So we're going to see a change in the milk, change in the udder, or a change in the cow. Subclinical is we're going to define here. Subclinical is meant to be something you can't tell, but we tell by somatic cell count levels. So there is something there, but we just standing 10 feet away from the cow, you can't see any problem. So if we're looking at our clinical mastitis, we're going to apply scores. So one is considered mild. The sign is what changes in the milk. So we've got abnormal milk. We've got clots. We've got flakes. We've got separation. We've got something's not normal with the milk. Everything else about the cow seems fine, but we've got abnormal milk. Moving up to a two, we're going to involve the mammary gland. So abnormal milk, swelling or pain in that quarter. So she sets it to touch. It's a hot quarter. It's a hard quarter. Something involves the mammary gland in some way. So milk, mammary gland for two. Then we go into severe mastitis. This involves the entire cow. So you've got milk. You've got a normal milk. You've got swelling or pain in the mammary gland. And then you've got some sort of systemic or syst syst systemic response, she's showing a fever, she's dying, dehydrated, she's in shock. So to the hand of this uh, wild Sorry, thought I had. It. Sorry, my brain's not where it should be. My bad. Um, so systemic shock. So how do you remember the sequence? It's worse. It's worse. One, two, three. One, two, three also matches the parts involved, right? Milk, land, body. So one, two, three. So it starts with the milk changes first, and then we work our way out. So the gland first, then the entire body. So this is from the American Association of Bowline Practitioners. So they got one, two, and then they got two different threes. So we got mild abnormal milk treatment plan. A lot of places recommend oxytocin. <laughs> may or may not work. There's a lot of mixed results on that. No antibiotics unless the response lasts more than two or three days. So we got number two. We're going to treat the symptoms. Possibly use antibiotics. Maybe, maybe not, depending on what we're dealing with. The suggested frequent milk out. I don't know anybody who's ever done that. Has anybody ever done that? You milk her six times a day instead of. 
So what's the theory behind that? Flushing it out. You're flushing it out, trying to get it out. Because if we have the doubling of bacteria, the longer in an ideal environment, I would think growing on milk in a warm, wet place. Um, keep them there ideal. So we're looking at doubling every 20 minutes. So the theory is if we get them, push everything out as best we can, we should have less of a load on the animal, less of a need for um, white blood cells to go through. So three, we're talking about treating all the symptoms. So antibiotics and inflammatory drugs, possibly fluid, possibly um, call the vet if we need to. So severe and toxic, where we might that animal might not live through the day, depending on what's happening with that animal. So mastitis causing bacteria. So we can treat from the perspective of how severe is it? And that's probably what we do most of the time. But if we can sort through our mastitis causing bacteria, one of the ways to split them up is they're either environmental or contagious. Environmental means they're everywhere. So E. coli, certain staph species, um, they're everywhere, and so our job is to make sure that they don't get into the udder. So clean, dry TNs, good bedding management, keep the slop out. Contagious are bacteria that grow well in milk, and they tend to go from one cow to the next. So staph is the classic example of that, but we'll talk about each of them. So. We have streptococci out there. We got enterococci, coliforms, E. coli, Klebsiella. So most of these are associated with manure in one sh way, shape, or form. So E. coli is ubiquitous. Streps are ubiquitous. They're everywhere on the planet. So it's our job to keep them out of the udder as best we can. So. Contagious, we're trying to cure those animals or in the case of mycoplasm, get them out of the herd as quickly as possible. And trying to make sure the milk of a contagious cow does not get on the, the in the milk or mixed with the milk of a healthy cow. So back for a while there, we're just getting on top of this. They used to have staph aureus pens on a dairy. Does anybody experience those? They may be before your time. I think we're doing a much better job of mastitis. Where they had, they go through, they test the herd and half the herd with staph aureus. So the idea is like, well, if we get milk from these cows on the other cows, um, we're going to quickly transmit that staph aureus. Um, so they give separate beds for, or separate free stall pens for these staph aureus cows. Um, I don't think it's as prevalent as it used to be. I know Morrisville had one for a while back in the aughts. Um, just so many staph aureus cows. So, so let's talk about environmental. So caught for the from the environment, those bacteria are always around. It becomes a question of number. So how do we prevent those bacteria from growing? Clean environment, dry. So we talk about all the things bacteria need to grow. We got to get rid of one of them. So we got to get rid of the food, sand bedding. We got to get rid of the water. Keeping things dry, put wine down, new bedding. We can't get rid of air. Um, we can sometimes control the temperature. Um, and what's left? Uh, free of 
antibiotics and irritants and inhibitors. So when we're dealing with our environment, we're trying to get rid of the food, we're trying to get rid of the water, and we tend to add things that are going to make bacteria uncomfortable, it's like lime, salt, all those things that may help keep those bacteria counts down. So if we keep the bacteria counts down, we should be able to um, limit the exposure on those teat ends. So contagious is going to be caught from another cow. We're dealing with um, bacteria that grow and are sort of by obligated to milk on some level. So milk from one cow somehow gets into another cow, and that's how the infection goes from one animal to the next. So how might that occur? Milking procedures, that's why we use individual towels, right? We're not spreading milk from, from coming out, especially to prep that animal, from one cow to the next making sure our machines are clean before and after milking. Um, if you're milking infected animals, if you can milk those last, so you're not, those bacteria are gonna stay on that machine all the way through milking. Um, beds, you don't, don't want infected cows leaking on beds and another cow coming laying in that same bed. And then she gets all those bacteria on her tea deck and it's just a matter of pressure change to draw those in. We got the impacts. We talked about staph aureus cows going from one quarter impacting over to the diagonal quarter. So making sure that doesn't happen. So milking machine design, milking machine maintenance, making sure our prep procedures are what they're supposed to be. So we're trying to keep the milk from one cow, infected cow out from the other ones. So in both cases you have to design a management system that acts as a barrier between the bacteria and the tea end. So you're trying to keep the bacteria away from the tea end. The more bacteria we have on the tea end, the more likely we are to have problems. So we'll stop there today um, and we'll see you on Monday. Um, Dressford going out to a farm.